Lord, I need you. That's every one of our prayer tonight. That's, you're here on a midweek service. That's why we're here on a Wednesday night. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at a great contrast this evening that I believe will be a help to us to give us a pick-me-up in the middle of our week, encourage us in the Lord. Mark chapter 14. We're going to start reading in verse 1 and read the first 11 verses. The Bible says, After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. When I was in college, I had a job that required me to travel great distances. Some days I would drive two hours each way, a lot of driving. And one day uh, I had gotten in the car with my friend Kyle and another team at the same company was going to the same place. We were traveling from Lancaster to Ridgecrest, which is a, a good hour and 45 minutes away, even if you're speeding. And we, we set out on the journey and the idea was you kind of see which car got there first. Well, my job in, in the car with me and Kyle was to give directions. And so I got the directions on my uh, device or whatever, and, and, uh, I, but I started to get on the phone. And so I told my friend Kyle, I said, hey, just start going straight towards the 14, and then I'll tell you where to turn. Well, I was talking on the phone and not paying attention, and 10 minutes went by, and 20 minutes went by, and 30 minutes went by, and 40 minutes went by, and I realized that we still hadn't turned on the 14. And we, I, I looked over, and sure enough, there was a sign that said Antelope Valley Poppy Reserves. We were in the middle of the desert. And when I finally got off the phone, I told my friend, I said, why didn't you turn on the, four, on the 14? He said, you were supposed to tell me where to turn. The whole time, I thought we were going the right direction. I thought we were going the way we were supposed to go. I thought that we were going the right direction. Well, I thought wrong. And it took us a lot longer to get to work that day because of it. The way we think matters. Right thinking can lead us to God's plan for our lives, but wrong patterns of thinking can take one to places that they never desired to go. But God's word gives us very clear guidance to the right way of thinking. And so th what they're going to do this evening is examine the lives of two people who follow Jesus. Judas Iscariot and Mary who anointed Jesus. And tonight we will understand how their thoughts, their motivations, and their way of thinking cause them to end up in two completely different places in the end. Let's start off this evening by noticing the actions of the two. The actions. Let's start off with Mary. Look with me, if you will, at Mark chapter 14, verse 1. And after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. Here we find the very end of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. In just a few days' time, he would be betrayed, he would be crucified, and then three days later, he would raise from the dead. We're coming to the end of his time here on earth. And we find in this story that there is a plot uh, of the Pharisees, of the religious leaders, the scribes, to try to get rid of Jesus. If there was a Pharisee's most wanted list, Jesus would have been at the very top. They wanted him gone. 
He was a threat to their livelihood. He was a threat to their following. He was causing a lot of problems for them, and so they wanted to get rid of Jesus. Continue reading with me in verse 3. And being in Bethany. Now, Bethany was just about a 45-minute walk from Jerusalem. It was pretty close. And Jesus went to Bethany many times. We know that's where he saw Mary and Martha. We know that's where he raised Lazarus from the dead and did other miracles during his ministry. And let's continue with the reading here. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at me, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now, we notice that in this verse, it says there came a woman. Now, we know from looking at other of the Gospels in the book of John that this woman was named Mary. John 11 verse 2 tells us that it was Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment. Now, this is the very same Mary that just a short time earlier chose to spend time listening to Jesus instead of helping Martha with things around the house. This is the same Mary that had witnessed Jesus allow her brother Lazarus to die so he could perform a miracle and raise him from the dead. Mary had seen Jesus do some pretty incredible things. And now we notice the phrase in that verse that this woman, who we now know as Mary, having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious, Now, when we see that alabaster box, we may think of like an actual square box. But in fact, that was more of a vase, if you will, that would have a lid on it to hold in perfume or to hold in something that uh, the air could allow to escape. And this alabaster box, uh, because it was an alabaster box, we know that this most likely came from the country of India. At that time, that's where the the plant of nard, which spike nard perfume came from, was pretty much grown only in India. And so this alabaster box of perfume had traveled a long way to make it to Jerusalem or to Bethany just outside of Jerusalem where they were on this evening. Now, this passage tells us that the alabaster box of ointment was very precious. It was worth a lot of money. In fact, later in our story, we'll find out just exactly how much it's worth. But this bottle of spikenard was very rare. It was very valuable. It required great finances to be able to purchase something like this. The very item itself sent the message that, hey, someone important was in the room or something special was about to happen. And so I would imagine that when Mary walked in the room with this expensive perfume, that all eyes were on her. Everybody was looking at her. It'd be as if you walked into a dinner party with a $60,000 wad of cash in your hands. That's essentially what happened when Mary walked in the room with this box. Everyone was watching to see, what is she going to do with that perfume? And then we see that Mary did the unthinkable. Look back at verse 3 with me. And she break the box, and poured it on his head. That phrase, break the box, means that she broke the seal on the top of the jar that would allow air to seep in, and then the Bible says that she then poured it on his head. Now we know from later in this story that this bottle of spikenard would have been worth about a whole year's wages, or the average salary. I looked today, uh, the average salary in Los Angeles is about $60,000. And so imagine with me if I had a stack of $60,000 up here tonight and I took a match and I lit it on fire and you watched it burn. That's what the people at that dinner felt like that night. Now, if she was pouring it on the ground or if she was pouring it on any random person's head, that would surely have been a waste. But she didn't pour it on the ground. She didn't pour it on any random person's head. She poured it on Jesus' head. She anointed Jesus' head as an act of worship. She anointed the head of her Savior. We see that Mary worshipped Jesus with this act of pouring this expensive perfume on the head of Jesus. We saw the actions of Mary, but now let's see the actions of Judas. Whenever somebody does something good, somebody always has something bad to say about it. Now look with me at the next verse in verse 4. And there were some that had indignation 
within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Now, Mark in this passage right here is very generous. He doesn't say any names. However, John's not so generous. John tells us who said that. If we look at John chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, we see, And then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. So here we see the person making this bold statement isn't just any disciple, it's Judas. It's Judas Iscariot, the one that would very soon betray him. And we notice in the way, the tone that he said this, the words that he said, that Judas had a serious attitude. That word indignation means an extreme anger or a, a, a deep disgust. The way, I could imagine the way he said those words was not favorable. It was not kind. It was not gentle. He was upset, almost as if I burned $60,000 in front of you this evening. And Judas was extremely upset. Why was this waste of the ointment made? You see, Judas saw it as a waste, but Mary saw it as worship. Because Judas didn't value Jesus the way that Mary did. Essentially, Judas was saying, what a waste. When I was in uh, 12th grade, I knew that the Lord wanted me to study and uh, to go into ministry, to, to work with people. And uh, I had started a little landscaping business to kind of cut some grass to make some money from college. And I started cutting grass for a policeman on my street. And he was a retired gentleman, but he was very cranky. He somehow found a problem every single time I ever cut his grass. It was either too long or it was too short or I missed a spot with weed whacking. There was always a problem, but somehow he still had me come back every week. And he just always seemed to find a problem with everything. Kind of a very irritated old man. And one day he brought me in house to pay me. And he asked me, so son, you're about done with high school. What are you going to do? And I told him that I felt like God wanted me to, to go into ministry and, and to help people. And he kind of had this look of disgust on his face. And after I finished talking, he looked at me and he said, what a waste. And I was a 12th grade kid, my whole life ahead of me. And he said, what a waste. And at first, it, it kind of really hurt me. But, you know, Ju Judas didn't understand what true worship was. Just like Mary, following God's plan for our lives is never a waste. The world may call us crazy. People may say, you're going to church again? Didn't you go on Sunday? You're here on a Wednesday too? You know, people can say all kinds of things. They can call it a waste. But when we know Jesus, when we have a relationship with Jesus, following him is never a waste. Mary viewed following Jesus as worship. She viewed this act of pouring this perfume on Jesus' head as an act of worship. We hear that word worship all the time. We hear it at church. We hear it all the time. We hear it on the radio, all kinds of places. But the word worship means to ascribe worth to someone or something else. To essentially say, I value this person or I value this thing. That's what it means to worship. To make something known or to ascribe a, a high value to something. And so essentially what Mary's doing here by pouring this ointment on Jesus is she's saying, I highly value you, Jesus. But Judas didn't like that very much. And the reason why is because we know that Judas was into money. You see, he knew the moment that she pulled that box out, how much it was worth. He didn't go get on his phone and Google how much is a, 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 a 300 or how much is a, a thing of spike nard. No, he knew when she pulled that jar out exactly how much it was worth, about a year's wages. You see, Judas knew the value of commodities of that day. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was the treasurer for the group of disciples. He was the one that carried the bag. He carried the money. He was the one that was in charge of money in and money out. He had money on his mind all the time. He knew that the ointment was worth a year's wage. And so Judas viewed this box as money that he could use and maybe even steal. Mary viewed this box as a tool she could use to worship. When, Jesus saw, or when Judas saw that box, he couldn't take his eyes off it. He was, he was fixed on it. And so the moment that she broke that on Jesus, he was not happy. He, he was thinking, we could have done so much if we sold that box of ointment. But Mary 
wanted to give it to Jesus. She wanted to worship Jesus with it. She wanted to anoint Jesus with this oil. You know, I believe that giving is something that reveals a person's heart. Giving is something that reveals a person's true motives. Uh, just the other day, I was discipling a, a newer Christian. He got saved last year at our church, which is awesome. He got saved in May, and we were discipling. We were kind of coming to the end of our discipleship uh, in the middle of January. And that morning, he had just gotten his giving statement from the church in the mail. And he had just received that giving statement. And when we first started our discipleship, it was kind of fresh on his mind. And so he said, Ben, I, I got my giving statement today. I said, oh, that's great. That's so, I'm glad you started giving to the church. And he said, oh, I'm not happy with it. He said, I couldn't believe how little I gave compared to how much I made. And then he looked at me and said, I'm going to change that this year. And you know, he's growing like a weed spiritually. Every time I meet with him, he's read way more than he needed to in his Bible reading. He's, gro he's growing as he walks with the Lord. And as a result of that, or as a result of his devotion to the Lord, he wanted to give. Just like Mary giving a year's wage worth of ointment was no problem for her. You see, we notice that Mary held very loosely to the things of this world, while Judas held very tightly. And so we saw the actions of Mary, we saw the actions of Judas, but now let's notice the response of Jesus. The way Jesus responded to the situation here, notice the way that Jesus responded to Mary. Verses 8 through 9 he says to Mary, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. So essentially, he's calming the other uh, people down. He's calming Judas down saying, hey, hey, don't be upset. She's worshiping me. She's anointing my body. Now, Jesus knew in that moment that in just a few days, this person that's accusing right here, this person that, that's questioning him was going to betray him. He was going to be put to death and be buried. Now, if you think with me for a moment, she dumped an entire jar of perfume on his head, and we see in John, even wiped it on his feet. And I would imagine that if you dumped an entire jar of perfume on a person, they would probably smell like that perfume for several days. And so the reality is that as Jesus was betrayed and then beaten, taken to multiple trials, and then crucified, he probably still had some of that ointment smell on him. And so essentially what, she, what Jesus is saying here is that she's here, she's doing this to anoint my body for the burying. Now I'm sure Mary had no idea that that's what she was doing, but Jesus knew, and it was obvious that she was led to do that. We see that Jesus praised her, and look at that phrase, for doing what she could. She did her part. You know, I believe that every single Christian has a part to play in getting the gospel here and around the world. We're going to talk about that a little bit in missions conference in a few days. But every Christian can do something. And here we see that Mary did her part. She did what the Lord wanted her to do. And so Jesus responded fav favorably to Mary. But now let's see the way that Jesus responded to Judas. Look with me at verse 6. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. Essentially, he's saying to Judas, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's doing me a favor. She's doing a good thing. We see here that Jesus defends this woman. He's defending this woman in, a, in her vulnerability walking in in front of a, a dinner full of a bunch of men to anoint Jesus. He, he defends her as she worships him. Jesus defends her as she's doing his will, as she's doing her part, as the Bible says. And then we see that Jesus calls out his faulty reasoning. He's saying, look, you say you want to sell it and give it to the poor. Jesus knew that really wasn't what he was going to do with it. But Jesus is saying, look, the poor will be around always. You can always give to them and help them out. But I'm only here for a little bit longer. And so what she did was more important in this moment because of who I am. Mary understood who Judah, her Jesus was. But I want us to notice that after being corrected, Judas allowed the correction to make him bitter. After being corrected, 
we see in our passage that Judas immediately goes and betrays him. I had read this passage many times, but it wasn't until when I was studying for this that I noticed that immediately after he's corrected by Jesus, he goes directly to betray him. That was the last straw for Judas. I would imagine he was probably irritated by some of the things that Jesus had been doing in those days, some of his teachings that maybe rubbed him the wrong way, but this was it. Being confronted in front of other disciples, being called out in in that way, in that place, in that time, was the last straw for Judas. He went immediately from there, and the very next verse says that he went and found a way to betray Jesus. He went immediately to the high priests. He went immediately to the Pharisees, And said, all right, I'm in. Let's betray him. And we see that Judas allowed this correction to make him bitter. Now, as Christians, when we are corrected, whether that's the Bible confronting us of our sin or the Holy Spirit leading us that something we're doing isn't right, how we respond to that correction is so important. If we respond right, we'll repent. And we'll get back on track and we'll follow the Lord. But if we don't respond well to that correction, we become on the path to becoming bitter like Judas. Judas did not respond well to the correction of Jesus. He allowed that correction to make him bitter. So what can we learn from that? The first thing I I think of when I look at that situation there is that we shouldn't question God's word when it confronts something in our life. When we're reading the Bible and it clearly says something that we shouldn't do and we are doing it, we should take the Bible for exactly what it says and obey it. We shouldn't question it or try to explain it away or say, oh, that was for Bible times. No, if the Bible says it, we should do it. God's word, the Bible is inspired by God and it is directly impactful to our lives today. I I, I think that we should also be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We should keep short accounts with God and we should allow the correction of God to make us better and not bitter. So we notice the actions of uh, Mary and Judas. We notice the response of Jesus to them, but now notice the results. Where Where did this end up for them? We see in Mark chapter 14, verse 9, that Mary is remembered forever. The Bible says, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for her, for a memorial of her. Essentially, Jesus says, because what she did was so significant, I'm going to make sure that wherever the gospel's preached one day, that this story is mentioned. And here we are talking about it 2,000 years later. Jesus kept his promise. And so we see that the results of Mary's worship was that she was remembered forever. Now let's notice the result of Judas's actions. The results of Judas's actions, his life ends in misery. The Bible continues in verse number 10 and 11. And Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. And so Judas, as we mentioned a moment ago, went directly from this situation to the very next verse. He's now betraying him. He's giving Jesus over to the rulers to to be able to crucify him shortly here. And we see that he gave him to the Pharisees, and this led to Jesus being betrayed and then dying on the cross, which then, according to the end of the story, led to the end of Judas's life as well. If we look at a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 27... We notice in verse 1 through 5, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. We see that Judas's life ended in misery. 
his life ended in a guilt-ridden suicide. Where just a few days before, he was following Jesus. He had an opportunity to listen to his teaching. Jesus was even kindly correcting him, giving him an opportunity to get back on track. But here we see the end for Judas is suicide. Judas' life ends in misery. We see that Mary is remembered forever, but Judas' life ends in misery. And so though we look at two people. They both were followers of Jesus in the sense that they spent time with him. Judas was with Jesus nearly every day. Mary was with him every time she could see him. And when she did, she made the most of it. Two people, they both were with Jesus, the Savior of the world, yet they ended up in two very different places, didn't they? One is remembered forever for bringing glory to God. And the other's life ended in a guilt-stricken suicide. Why is that? Well, I believe there's a few reasons. I think the number one reason is the motive. Let's take a moment to examine Judas and Mary's motive. Judas's motive was clearly money. Everything was about money to Judas. Everything had to do with money. In fact, John 12, verse 6 says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what, what was put therein. He was stealing from the bag. Judas's motive was money, but Mary's motive was worship. She had a sincere desire to worship her Savior. You know, I believe at times our motives can get out of whack. We might say, yes, God's the most important thing in our life, but many times our actions don't back that up. And so I encourage you tonight, on a Wednesday night in the middle of a long, busy week, Allow the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to do a motive check on your heart. And ask, ask yourself questions like, why did I come to church tonight? Why do I serve in the ministry? Why do I give? Why do I fill in the blank? What is your motive for what you do for the Lord? Our motive should be the motive of Mary, a motive of worship. A motive of holding loosely to the things of this world and holding tightly to the things of God and the kingdom of God. Mary had the right motive. And to Mary as well, her relationship with Jesus was priceless. We see that her relationship with Jesus was worth a, even more than a whole year's wage in the fact that she anointed Jesus. Her relationship with Jesus was priceless to her, whereas for Judas, his relationship with Jesus was worth about 30 pieces of silver, or even less. Because when you look at the passage, he didn't even ask for money. They offered it in the end. His relationship with God was worthless to him. Let me ask you a question. Is your relationship with God priceless? Is it a number one priority? Is it a non-negotiable? Is being in church around God's people, growing in your faith, is that priceless to you? It was priceless to Mary. Mary's relationship with Jesus was priceless, but Judas' relationship with Jesus was worthless. We see that Mary's relationship was priceless. We also notice that Mary sought to serve and glorify God while Judas was selfish. He was seeking his own glory. He was in it for himself. He wasn't in it for Jesus. He wasn't in it for others. All he cared about was himself. And the last thing I want us to notice tonight before we close was the, is the touch. The touch. If we look back at our passage, we'll actually look at a, a parallel passage in John 12, verse 3. The Bible says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. You see, her touch was a touch of worship. Her touch was a touch of service. Her touch brought about God's will. We have one more verse to look at this evening, and that's about Judas' touch. The Bible tells us a few verses later in Mark 14, verses 45 through 46. This is Judas here. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straight away to him, that's Jesus, and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. 
we see that Judas' kiss, Judas' touch led to the death of Jesus. Judas' touch was a touch of betrayal. You and I have the opportunity to touch hundreds of people every day. Coworkers, friends, family, children, people in this room right here. Every conversation we have, every meal we eat, we have the opportunity to touch people around us in some way. What does your touch communicate with those around you? Are those people in your life better off because of your touch in their life? Does your touch in the lives of others point people to Jesus like Mary's did? Or is it a touch of betrayal, a touch of insincerity? We see that we should be, desire to be Christians where our touch brings blessings and not curses. And so as we close this evening, let's be reminded that we should have the motive of Mary, a motive of worship, and not the motive of Judas, a motive of money, a motive of, of self-glory, a motive of betrayal. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as we pray, I challenge each person here to think about their life for just a moment, to consider their motives lately. Why do they do, why do you do what you do? Do you do it out of a heart of a worship? Or maybe recently you've been doing things for the Lord out of a heart of necessity or out of grudgingly. Maybe tonight do some business with God and ask the Lord to give you the heart of Mary, a heart of worship. How can you grow in your worship of Jesus? How can you protect your heart from ending up like Judas? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for being so good to us. Lord, for giving us your word as a guide to help us to think right, to have the right motives, to remind us to keep you as the number one priority in our life. And Lord, I pray that as we leave on this Wednesday night midweek service, that Lord, you would help each person here, Lord, to have a motive check, and that they would renew their commitment to worshiping you in everything they do and everything they say and the way they live. I pray in Jesus' name.